You're listening to the Alex Wolf Podcast. Interesting conversations about innovation, economics, culture, and history for the independent thinkers and curious minds. I'm your host, Alex Wolf. All right, well, uh, here we are. And I am very excited to talk about this specific topic which is what I'm calling the Diva Taoist, aka how I became sort of a Taoist and how I use that in my life and in my business um, because I feel like it's worth noting. I have a philosophy about life <laughs> um, that is kind of not your typical go, go, go entrepreneur mentality. And I think it's worth noting that because I know there are a lot of people who look up to me for business strategy and advice or inspiration and usually that means they assume I am a go 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 hustle kind of person like everyone else and I'm not I'm more into what I guess you could call like practical entrepreneurism which means it's not about business just for growth, but business for sustainability in your lifestyle. Um, So yeah, I wanted to um, first, I guess, talk about the difference between Zen and uh, Taoism. So just so you know, both of these are ancient, uh, mostly Chinese philosophies. And I'm sure you've seen people throw them out a a lot of the time. People talk about Zen, you know, as being a way to describe being calm or, you know, you know, yeah, calm, cool and collected. Um, And Taoism is sort of in the similar vein. You've heard, I'm sure, of like the Tao of Pu or uh, the Tao of Riza from Wu-Tang. He has a book, I believe, called something along those lines. Um, And if you're super new to Taoism, then just know that it does Um, It is spelled with a T, but it is pronounced with a D sound. Okay, that's the boring stuff. (laughs) Um, The reason why, there there isn't much of a need to differentiate between Zen and Taoism because they're very, very much similar and they overlap. But basically, Zen philosophy is about embracing reality and the direct reality experience. So instead of wishing or wanting or dreaming or fantasizing about what you want, or what you think you should have, or what you want the world to look like or be like. It is about responding and being receptive to your present reality, not a future, not a past, but direct experience. So it is obviously just being sensitive to how your your bodily um, receptors and functions are responding in your environment, whether they be uh, good or bad. So if you're in a cold room, it's about really experiencing the depth of coldness. Um, if you are really joyous, it's about really experiencing the depth of the joy. And yeah, I mean, these are similar principles. It's It stems from all of the sort of like um, new age slash pop psi idea of being in the present, being in the now. Um, and finding peace in the present moment. So Zen is not what, it's it's almost kind of anti-America, but not in a political way. I just feel like America's culture is deeply based in dreams, right? The whole idea of the, the country is about this American dream or, you know, the gold rush or just coming here to fulfill a fantasy or dream in your head. And I don't think that's bad or anything, but it's not Zen, right? Zen is not about dreams. It's not about any illusion whatsoever. It is about direct reality. Now, Taoism is a little bit more, it's definitely about experiencing direct reality, but it's also about non-interference. So Zen is being in the cold room and feeling the cold, and Taoism is not trying to interfere with the experience. Um, so I'm sure some people are like, what the hell, this sounds horrible, like, (laughs) why would I want to be in a cold room? And that's a superficial explanation. I think on a deeper level, Taoism was philosophized because, um, there were so many rises and fall, falls of power in ancient China and really all over the world. And a lot of it had to deal with force 
enforcement of government, enforcement of laws, enforcement of some people just forcing other people to do things. And Taoism is all about not forcing anything and trusting in this higher intelligence that is operating the universe. We see it, you know, when plants grow, we see it how our blood flows through our body. There is some kind of, um, you know, operation system, intelligence system that is making literally the world go round. And Taoism is about surrendering trust into that system and putting more trust into that system than putting that trust into our ability to think or problem solve or basically um, force our will onto things. It doesn't mean you shouldn't think. It doesn't mean you shouldn't take action. But it's a philosophy that prioritizes non-interference as a way of finding an equilibrium. It's not even so much about finding a solution. It's about finding harmony. And nature teaches us that harmony and solutions aren't necessarily the same thing. Like sometimes you do, you do need a winter to have a spring. You do need death to have rebirth. Um, and so having ju value judgments on the negative things in our culture don't necessarily translate 100% uh, in Taoist philosophy because a lot of those negative things aren't perceived as a negative un and unnecessary. They're perceived negative and necessary. So they're not trying to get rid of those things. They're trying to, well, the point is they're not trying. <laughs> they're just being with reality in this non-interference way. And I think that was very powerful for me as someone who studies tech philosophy, which really embodies these the prin these principles in the sense that I feel that because American culture is all about interference and, and Western philosophy has always been about interference. It's always been about let's, you know, let's ship ourselves to this country or let's go to this country and let's let's force our religion or let's force our ideology on these people because it'll help them become more aka or, or quote unquote, excuse me, civilized. And I don't know if that's always the best way to spark har harmony in, in communities. So when it comes to tech philosophy, a lot of the agenda, a lot of the narrative for big tech and tech in general, even in startup cultures, is about trying to find um, alleged solutions to what I um, interpret as very natural phenomena in life as, you know, such things as people trying to get rid of death or people trying to get rid of sadness or <laughs> any minor inconvenience whatsoever. I think that, you know, a lot of my work has shown that by trying to eradicate what we perceive as negative can backlash on us 10 times worse, um, you know, because whether we like it or not, there is a time and space for us to have adversity and negative things to happen to us to build character, to appreciate the good things. Um, and that's the whole, again, philosophy of um, Taoism and also yin and yang, right? Embracing good with bad and understanding their mutual necessity in order to let the world go around. So that is why I wanted to, to distinguish that. And how I got into this basically was um, I was listening to Alan Watts and just a disclaimer, Alan Watts, it took me about two years of listening to him before anything he started to say, say made sense. And I, I can't really explain why I decided to listen to him um, for that long <laughs> because I wasn't really getting anything out of it. I guess his voice sounded so, he spoke, you know, he speaks with so much conviction it sounds like he, what he's saying is so smart, and I guess it did bring some level of peace to me. But I got to be honest, in saying the first few years, I didn't know what the hell he was really talking about. And then I remember one day I was um, vacuuming in my living room, and he started to explain this principle between yin and yang, black and white, um, as colors, not as races, <laughs> and um, the necessity of these two polar opposites sort of dancing with each other in order to create reality. And I don't know, it just clicked in that moment and so so much of his other stuff started to make sense but to this day um, I can depend on Alan Watts and his you know words and his books to have a deeper and deeper meaning each time I listen to them and as someone who is a what do they call it sapiosexual it's not really a sexual thing but I love intellectual stimulation um, so as someone who cares about that it's really comforting to know people like him exist because I need to have 
databases of deep stuff to just, you know, lose my mind in. And I'm guessing if you're listening to this, you're probably the same. So it started with listening to him. And, you know, he he was definitely famous for, you know, I guess, allegedly uh, interpreting or translating Eastern philosophy to Western minds, because it was just really hard. I mean, especially he was popularized, popularizing himself in the 50s or yeah, 60s. Um, and even, yeah, 50s, which it's like in America, if you were talking about anything but Easter and Jesus, people were just not taking that stuff well. They associated anything that wasn't Jesus as something that was demonic. Um, and I just can't imagine how hard it must have been to talk about these principles um, to to the climate of that time. But, to, you know, what's so again, satisfying about his work is that it's still so relevant. Um, he predicted so much of what we of where we are today. And I definitely use his philosophy as a North Star for mine, as far as, you know, how I approach my life and how I approach business and definitely how I approach technology. So it started listening to Alan Watts. I will say some lectures are more digestible and easier to understand than others. The one I'm going to link to, which I, I think was the the biggest um opener for me to start understanding the other ones this isn't the black and white one this is a different one it's called why the urge to improve yourself and it's basically him talking about how american culture again is obsessed with um self-improvement and believes in self-improvement and he basically breaks down <laughs> this idea that you know what if you can't improve yourself and um, acknowledges how that is at first very disappointing because we are raised in this culture to believe that unless you're improving yourself, you might as well just be a loser, right? Like the whole point of this culture is upward growth to no end. Um, and that growth also includes who you are as a person. And at first when you hear, oh, there's no point of improving myself because I can't, I think a lot of us think that means oh if I'm a crappy person that means I should just stay a crappy person or it means like oh if I'm lazy that means I should just stay lazy it's not about those particular parts of your quote-unquote self it's about understanding your ego as a social construct and understanding that to try to improve a co social construct with this co social construct is um you know, mostly impossible. So I'm not going to get too much into that right now because, again, this stuff takes a while to click. Um, and I also just, yeah, that's another topic. <laughs> um, so, but I, I love that lecture because I listened to it every time I felt like I was trying to improve myself, but I didn't know why. Um, you know, and I, my story is, and I talk about this in the first chapter of my book, is that I you know, wanted to be successful, I wanted to be famous, I wanted to be pretty, I wanted what America told me I should have. And when I say America, I don't like to generalize. I'm talking about my ecosystem of images as far as music videos, you know, Instagram, the images I was being served as an adolescent really made me desire to replicate the image. And from what I saw, if I was a certain amount of, you know, if I fit the, the beauty standard in a certain way, and if I had a certain amount of money, um, I would be like really happy, like that was the key. And so I sought for that and um, I got some of it, right? The whole story is I built my first company and I started to make, you know, very good money for a 21 year old and I got a lot of ten attention and popularity and I was anorexic at the time, so I was, you know, in my mind, unfortunately, anorexia is a sickness. So in my mind, I, I was bo I was borderline between like, oh, I'm attractive and I'm not. But the point was, I was very, uh, you know, focused on it. It was like a main priority. It was like, okay, do I fit this beauty standard? Blah blah blah. Looking back, I think I kind of look like crap. But that's besides the point. Um, at the time, I'm like thinking, okay, I'm participating. I, I'm I'm fitting this image, right? And as long as I look, the part the feeling should click, right? The feeling of like ultimate happiness or whatever the fuck people promise you. So I got it. And then I realized that like, 
I could not have possibly hated myself more. <laughs> it took me a while to realize that, but I was like, oh, like, nope. Like, um, nothing external is going to make me happy. Um, this is not as good as it looks. So, I'm, you know, I can look back and be grateful because I was able to then focus on the inside of me. Um, and I also was making an amount of money that I just was unprepared to deal with. Um, and I had at that point bought pretty much everything I wanted to buy. And so the, it just, again, I just remember specific moments where, you know, I made a certain amount and I didn't have any friends to call. Um, and I've told this story many times and I apologize if you've heard it before, but basically like, you know, I had people to call, but not people who would have celebrated with me. You know, it's either I was going to call up envy or I was going to call up jealousy. I wasn't really going to call up celebration. Um, and, you know, again, I'm grateful these moments happen because I can look back and be like, yay, now I realize like money doesn't, you know, buy happiness. Everyone says it, but until you, you know, get it, you don't really feel it or experience it. So that's, you know, that is really when my my whole life changed and I started to just really pay attention to, okay, what makes me happy? Like, if it's not this, then like, what really brings me joy? And then guess what it is? It's like, little by little, I'm realizing like, oh, I love sunshine. <laughs> oh, I love sitting in the park and like, doing nothing but like staring at the water. Oh, I love warm cups of coffee. Like, there are these things that I've been, I've had access to this entire time but wasn't able to appreciate because I was so obsessed and so um you know I was chasing that that desire and that dream so I couldn't appreciate sunshine I couldn't appreciate coffee I couldn't tell how much I loved it and um then I realized it was just like these little things and I could be happy with these little things and that of course impacted the way I did business because I didn't feel the same pressure that I noticed my peers had to be bajillionaires like I was just like aren't you guys good like I'm good and it, it instead of it wasn't like oh haha ha, I figured it out like you guys are like on the rat race and it I wasn't it, it wasn't like me um making fun of them it was more like I started to get insecure because the other thing about American culture is that you know you think like you think the way it's gonna go is like you get this like sense of enlightenment and like you know uh, you're going to be, um, I guess, appreciated for it or something, or like other people will see it and, and they'll do the same thing. But no, you, I, my experience at least was like, something's wrong. Like, what do you mean you don't have goals? What do you mean you don't have, like, you don't want to grow and you don't want a bigger house and you don't want like more money. Like it was just, no one was understanding me. I had friends who were just like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't relate. I got to do this and I got to get that. And so I started to get insecure about my happiness, <laughs> you know, or at least my satisfaction. And so that is why Alan Watts and Taoism and Zen was my comfort zone because these were spaces where it was okay to be happy. It was okay to be contented. It was okay to appreciate sunshine and water and things like that. And um, of course, I've had so much friction and tension in being in the business world and having this philosophy because I'm often, you know, pulled to play into that go, go, go narrative. But I, you know, I am, I guess you can say, pr I, I guess I am proud of myself for being consistent about like knowing, my whole thing is I know what happens to me when I go into that land and I get unhappy. So I've been very consistent about saying like, you know, if that works for y'all, that works for y'all, but this is what works for me. I'm okay with this. I'm okay with running my business like this. Um, because I realized that I'm actually happier when I do it this way. So, um, yes, I had to lay all that down um, because the truth is, and I've realized, is that there are other people that are like me, and they, they do believe in business and economics, and they do believe in being financially empowered, but there's a nuance. Not everyone believes in those things and also wants to like hustle themselves to burn out into debt. So that's my people. It's probably you if you're still listening. <laughs> and um, basically, the way that I can still work and get things done 
is by interpreting civilization as you know a, so a social construct which it that is what it is so when i say that just for clarification is that this need for more this desire for more that we're i think for the most part pushed to participate in through images and through our culture and our peers that is built into this social construct that we live in now what is a social construct it's basically just rules and roles it's the structure built on top of the nature right so here we are on planet earth there's dirt there's rain there's sky when men come together when humanity comes together we start to civilize whatever geographical location we're in and we start to assign roles to people you know well this is the fisherman this is the bakerman this is the housekeeper this is the blah 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 this is the priest this is the lawyer this is the judge and so to live in a society to live in one of these civilizations you have to pick a role and you will be the, the more your role is valued and needed by other people the more um, people will either appreciate you or respect you or at least leave you alone people have problems with people who live in civilizations and aren't participating in some way um you know those are the, like the freeloaders or you know people get mad off of the moochers and stuff like that so lord knows like you know if you're creative you want to just lay back and be like what do you mean like civilization i just want to like you know i just want to live off off this and not you know necessarily have to like work because work sucks <laughs> or it's, it's also because we live in a social construct that doesn't really value art in the same way other social constructs do so you know it can feel like oh i might as well lay back because my, the way i want to contribute isn't valued here um but the reason why it's helpful to, at least for me, to interpret um, civilization and the economy as a social construct is because, okay, I know that this isn't the inherent earth, right? I know that there's like, there's um, life beneath civilization that's, I guess you could say, more direct. It's the direct reality. It's that Zen reality. It's, it's science. It's uh, chemistry. It's the way that molecules are interacting with each other, right? Those don't necessarily care about civilization, aka this pandemic, right? <laughs> um, things are operating on this molecular level that aren't necessarily in alignment with the social construct that we build, the roles that we give women, the roles that we give men, et cetera, et cetera. So, once I can I say, okay, because the thing is, if you think it's all one thing, there's a lot of people who don't even realize they live in a social construct and think that's that this is reality, right? Obviously, there's people who think that. So once I realize the social construct is built in a way that, you know, is going to push me and is going to pressure me to want more, no matter what, you know, even if I'm a if I'm a millionaire, it's going to tell me to be a billionaire. If I'm a billionaire, it's going to tell me to go to space. Right. If you let me look around, if you're if you're a millionaire, it's going to tell you to run for president. Right. <laughs> if you're it, it's like there's this like expectation that you should want no less than a Nobel Peace Prize, that if you don't have there's even like Instagram quotes that float around that say, like, if your dreams don't scare you, then they're not big enough. Like that is America. 100%. I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world. I'm saying it doesn't work for me. And I know it doesn't work for a lot of other people. Because, again, to live out this dream, and to prioritize this dream comes at the cost of neglecting a lot of your reality. And your direct reality, your present moment has, you know, the access to a lot of peace and joy. <laughs> if you want to, that's the I don't I'm not making this up. This is ancient Tibetan and Chinese philosophy. And it's also probably like, your number one app on your phone is telling you to just like sit down and enjoy the present moment. So um, once I realized that this social co construct in particular is a hamster wheel, I stopped expecting it to make to take me anywhere. And I started to learn how to enjoy going around in circles. <laughs> now you're either like, hmm, or you're like, what the hell? But I feel like most of our pain you know, depression and anxiety is in fashion in this culture. I hate to say it, but like, not only is it in fashion, it's the norm. And what I'm what I mean by that is that, I mean, it's it's expected that in a room full of in a room of five millennials, one of them are going to have some type of chronic anxiety or depression. Now, 
to me, it's very clear that that means that there's something in this social construct that produces this type of depression and anxiety, right? It's not coming from nowhere. It must be coming from some type of lifestyle or philosophy or perspective, um, some type of pressure, right? And it sucks. And of course, like building my first internet company, dealing with my own um, eating disorder, having my own mental problems, um, I was very concerned about how technology impacted, you know, was, was participating in so much of this anxiety and depression. So anyway, um, instead of thinking this hamster wheel was going to take me to this magic land that we keep talking about, this dream that is not really tangible, right? I mean, it's like, even if you do get the white picket fence and you get the marriage and you get those things, like there's still life to live. There's still every day. Um, it's not like you get that one moment and for eternity, you know, you, you never get a paper cut again or you're never going to sit in traffic again. That's just not the case. You look at situations like Kobe, look at situations like, you know, the, the unfortunate events that we see play out in people's lives, particularly when it comes to rich and, and famous people, because, uh, you know, I, I do think there's this sort of subconscious belief that, oh, well, these people have, they're immune to mis unfortunate. Uh, misfortunate events right it's not the case like there is that's just not the case so instead of saying instead of running faster on this wheel instead of saying okay well I'm not going to be happy with this amount so maybe I'll be happy with this amount and instead of doing that which here here's I'm not judging you if you do it I've learned early on that you can't get mad at people for playing this game some people really get a kick out of it you know what I mean? And some people are miserable at doing it, but it doesn't matter how much I try to change them. I know that when I was in that phase, there's nothing you could have told me to stop chasing, right? I had to reach a certain level of it and then realize it just was not going to give me what I wanted. So I'm. this is not a big, I'm not preaching. I'm not saying, oh, if only everyone just did what I did, the world would be a better place. Hell no, I don't believe in that. I love diversity in thought, in belief, in philosophy, in lifestyle. I love that we have shallow people, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, I started to love going around in circles. I started to say, you know what? Civilization is amazing. And then that's how you get the nerd Alex Wolf, right? <laughs> that's how you get the, the content I make about economics and, and innovation because I'm like, wow, it's so cool to see what makes the world go round. It's so cool to see what um, what gets invented and how that changes and how we take these raw molecular elements and perform alchemy that turns it into this microphone I'm speaking into and this table I'm leaning on and things like that. And I'm like, wow, that's fucking amazing. Like that can just rip my head open for the rest of my life, I hope. Like I said, I love to be curious and I love to learn shit I don't know. And if I don't know, then I get depressed. Rising in Gemini, just so you know, <laughs> for my astrology folks. So um, civilization is really fascinating. Does it suck sometimes? Yes. As an artist, I'm the first one to say that, right? Artists never really jived with like society and like social constructs. If anything, the artist represents, you know, again, this this relationship to the the more molecular level of life, the less civilized side, side um, part of life. So, um, yeah, I basically broke up with fantasy and I fell in love with reality. Um, and when you're on the wheel, because the thing is like, OK, well, I'm in civilization. I can either like whine about it and be like oh, like, I'm going to, like, not drive a car and I'm going to not have a job and, like, go super hippie, which is fine. Again, I appreciate the hippies, but I'm, like, eh, I'm too bougie for that. <laughs> I'm too used to Amazon Prime for that. So um, I'm just going to stay in this society, but I'm going to get clever. And I think that's what um, I think that's what certain people do. I was going to say, like, certain philosophers do, but I think it's a people thing, like, you can still participate, but just try to be clever about, okay, how am I going to make this social construct an entertaining 
thing or just like somewhat pleasurable so it doesn't it's not this like huge burden so um broke up with fantasy i broke up with wanting that dream x right like dream job dream man dream body dream house um it just doesn't work for me because again i get too distracted by the dream that i'm not embracing this like lovely real life that's happening to me um and then i started to fall in love with the reality meaning like i was again and my friends look at me like i'm crazy people look at me like i'm crazy but i can be in love with the smell of garlic sauteing i can that like a hundred percent satisfies me um more than like um you know trying to chase more revenue or like whatever um i can i obviously revenue and like those social construct responsibilities are still part of my life but i don't let them rob those everyday experiences um, and it's made me a very sensitive person, not emotionally, but um, biologically. <laughs> so like my my eyes are sensitive, my ears are sensitive, my skin is sensitive because I've become very receptive. I've trained my body to be very receptive to um, to to reality, to sound and taste and sight and all of those things. Um, and so it basically what I'm saying is that, you know, um, I can't drive in a fast car and play loud music because that like uh, i i feel like again the the context of what i'm saying is our culture numbs your senses right and i talk about this um in my one of my lectures about technology but uh a lot of our tech and a lot of this culture is about blasting your ears blasting your eyes blasting your taste buds um so that you can't appreciate organic reality for what it is you can only like live in this very artificial reality and stimuli that we've created. Um, and to me, again, it's unfair, I think, to my body because I feel like I get so much real life, so much real life and so much um, real years I get to add on to my life by being a receptor. So, um, but with all that being said, I call myself the diva Dallas. Now, why do I do that? Um, so <laughs> I guess it does kind of start with the fact that um, I, I always definitely related to this like role. Okay, so back to social constructs, right? Social constructs involve you having to play a role in order to participate in the benefits of civilization. Clean water, you know, plumbing, cars, things like that. So um, since the beginning of time, Kings and queens used to like hire jesters and jokers, right? Um, and like this is uh, this is related to the philosophy of the Joker from DC, right? Um, like uh, Batman and the Joker. Um, the Joker represents the reminder of how artificial our social construct is. So part of why the kings and queens would hire the jester is to laugh at themselves, right? Usually the jester would make a joke. Or, or, or act out something that would make a mockery of the king or the queen or the people or the whole point was to make fun right comedy is about making fun of ourselves um and you know the state of comedy has, has drastically changed because um our, our culture has become more serious and um people don't want to make fun of themselves or they take it as a threat right so what happens in societies um that take themselves very seriously um we lose we lose the um that that just that juster essence what i mean is that we lose the ability to laugh at ourselves um and it just makes the room more tense right and i'm sure you felt that this year it's been impossible to not feel everything be more tense but um what i, I bring up the jester because the diva the role of the diva in society is kind of reminds me of it and here's why the diva is um it's it's like the joker or you can even say like the entertainer the role it plays because its inherent nature does make a mockery out of our culture and specifically our economy um and i'll give you three ways that i've noticed this in particular so um and and the reason why 
I want to make a mockery. And I think also my ego, the the social construct that is my ego, um, the when I say that, I mean like the role that I play again. For me, I don't take ego seriously. I see them as a social construct. So we'll talk about that another day. But basically it's like, okay, you're in this civilization. What role do you want to play? And I think my ego just resonates with this persona of the diva because it's the most... Um, I guess you could say, what's the word? A absorbent way for our media climate to acknowledge the art our artificiality of our um, economy. Hopefully that didn't go, go over people's heads. I, I'm not trying to sound smart. I'm trying to like, actually like make sense. <laughs> um, so like the diva is... Um, Okay, so I'll give you three examples. So when I say that the diva emphasizes the artificiality of our world and our economy, it's basically the diva has bizarre requests, right? We're, the the diva is known, the archetype of the diva is known for like, for example, Mariah Carey washes her hair in champagne or she has some kind of like champagne uh, conditioner or something, um, which is like bizarre and crazy, but it's a um, example of how bizarre and crazy the economy has gotten to a point that there is a market for these bizarre needs um, and it's not just the diva who has bizarre needs this is you know throughout the economy but the diva is a great archetype because it's uh, a little bit more packageable but so I want to do that um, I and I've always loved to do that I always love to find bizarre markets I love starting studying the art market because it's all about um, you know all this invisible trade it looks like people are buying art and care about art but it's all about social stratification and it's all about creating a market for money that doesn't know where to be spent so like once you get to a certain level of wealth um there's a demographic that literally needs objects to buy that um <laughs> that represent where excess money can be spent and that is what the luxury market is all about so we're talking yachts and we're talking those types of things and so the diva is the I want to say a, a feminine um, archetype that embodies the luxury market because you know it's no secret that most ambitious men um, are ambitious at for the pursuit of a, cer a certain archetype of woman who has bizarre needs and if he can f fulfill her crazy ass needs it satisfies his um, depth of insecure like I don't want to say insecurity but his need of um of of wanting to be the ultimate provider the king provider so we've got the the the, the queen um like needer and then the ultimate in the king provider so it's just this interesting dynamic that plays out in civilization it's not for me it's not even like a value judgment thing it's just kind of like once the economy gets to a certain sophisticated point you're going to get these archetypes that that come out of it so she represents like, oh, I want a yacht named after me or I want this thing. And it's hilarious. It's like the most entertaining thing in the world to me, um, which, you know, uh, entertainment is definitely a, an amazing principle that I'll also talk about another day because it's it has so much to do with humanity and civilization as well. So um, another another um, awareness that uh, the diva archetype gives to society is that it emphasizes how our culture depends on shallowness to operate. So again, this specific social construct creates divas and um, it, it also operates, you know, with shallowness. So there's so many of us who wish others were deeper, myself included. Um, I, I, I consider myself a quote unquote deep person and not to say I don't, I think that people sometimes say that and think that that means they're um, superior like I'm on I think season three of girlfriends right now and Lynn is talking to Saul Williams who's a poet and she's like he's so deep and like that like makes him like untouchable but fuck that like in the sense of like just because you're deep doesn't mean you're better you're still human but I understand and appreciate depth obviously in people and I need depth for me to operate and I know a lot of us do and that's why we are so upset that we've built a culture that operates not just without depth but literally needs the shallowness to operate so a tangible example of that is JLo having insurance on her booty 
Um, and many stars having insurance on physical body parts because that is what they have used to build their fortunes. Um, I believe JLo has, I think, a $27 million insurance um, on her butt. And it's like the first thing you want to do is say, oh, my God, like that's so crazy and superficial. But the reality is the facts of this economy and this culture is that her booty <laughs> is a huge asset, oh my god, no pun intended, to to uh, American like pop culture. Maybe not so much as it was in like the, in her peak in like the 90s or early 2000s, but you know, that was a real insured transaction for a reason. It wasn't just to be ridiculous, it was because her livelihood would be threatened if her if her booty were to have any unfortunate event same thing with the, all the kardashian stuff i don't know what the hell they have insured but i know they have some body parts insured and again you know i see the beauty in the bazaar and what does it say about us as a culture where we need to take certain actions that ultimately are so shallow but also very necessary in order for certain industries to run particularly as someone who works in media particularly as someone who is a woman like these are um realities that i know so many of us have to consider and think about which is crazy it, it's not so much about like considering you know butt insurance but like there are just these weird decisions whether it be about your body, whether it be about, um, you know, your looks or whatever that you have to consider as far as what is really playing a role in everything here. And, and again, even, and this is not just a woman thing, I think also men have to deal with making decisions, shallow decisions. And I guess the main point I'm making is that even if you are a deep person, if you live in a shallow culture, you will have to make shallow decisions to keep a certain livelihood. Um, if you want to be deep, you risk a lot. And again, what's so important to me about playing out this archetype of the diva is making a mockery of that. I don't, I, I think that's ridiculous. And again, I think I want to point out how ridiculous it is. And again, I know I have to do it through playing a role versus getting on a podium or writing a book about it because that's not gonna work i'm not an expert in marketing for nothing y'all <laughs> um all right so the other example i have here is um the diva archetype embraces sad and unfair realities which i think is something that our culture misses uh we want to pretend inevitable sad and unfair things either don't exist or should not exist and therefore will not be acknowledged because we don't want them to exist and what i love about um kind of being whatever a diva kind of being a little bitch about things or bitchy about things is because i like to be blunt about realities i think that you do a bigger disservice by telling someone who's dealing with a harsh reality that that shouldn't be the case and think that oh well okay yeah great that you don't think that should be the case but i'm living it so what am i you know like what am i supposed to do with your wish of that wasn't the case i can't really do anything with that um and so a beautiful example i've been a girlfriend's fan since i was um probably like 13 i had season one and season two on dvd and i would watch it all the time and what a great show because like obviously i could not really relate as a 13 year old as much as i wanted to but like now it's like a whole nother thing but um season one episode four is the episode where they all the girls go on their <laughs> internet dates which is like crazy at the time and tony finds this billionaire guy or millionaire or whatever also tony is like the perfect example of the diva archetype which is why i find her character so fascinating and important in the series but um it's such a great episode because you know tony's the gold digger or at least you know i ain't saying she a gold digger but she ain't fucking with no <laughs> yeah so <laughs> um 
which I can respect 100%. We'll, we'll save that conversation for another day. But um, so everything's great. And all the girls are like, wow, you know, this guy sounds so great. So she meets him and he's dark. He's like dark skin. And Tony's, I guess you can say pretty dark, um, but he's darker than her. And um, she calls it off. And then her best friend, Joan, is like, oh, like, what the hell? Why would you call it off with this guy? He was perfect. He's rich. Like, he's eligible. Like, what's the problem? She's like, oh, he's too black. And all the friends are like, what? Like, in Maya, uh, the, the best line, she's, Tony, well, you ain't so light, bright, you damn self. <laughs> and, um, you know, call, calling her out on, on her hypocrisy. And it basically, she basically has to defend herself and saying, look, like, the reason why I'm even considered in the beauty standard in this culture is because I work out. She's She was honest about she dodges the sun so she doesn't get darker. Um, and she opens up about these, like, real tasks and, and lifestyle she has to live in order to keep a certain status in our culture. And Joan, you know, is like, wow, like, you know, you, you, you're a beautiful woman, but you don't think you're beautiful. And she says all these really beautiful lines that are about, like, being kind of heartbroken that Tony has to do or feels like she has to do these things to have a certain level of, like, respect and um, attention, I guess you could say, in our society. Or even, like, um, be attractive to a certain type of person. And also, Tony was saying she doesn't want her child to go through this. And if she were to have children with this guy who was darker than her, then, you know, she would be bringing a lot of these tasks, if not worse, or burdens um, to her children. And Joan, you know, is is you know, kind of wants her to not feel this way or wants her to not do this. And Tony says the best line. She says, uh, just because I have superficial values doesn't mean I'm not deep. Um, and that's really the crux of everything I'm saying here is that, um, yeah, Tony is a kind of like a gold digger and, and she's shallow, but she also has to deal with certain realities that someone like Joan won't have to deal with. And um, it's nice to hear Joan's little, like, heartfelt, it shouldn't be this way, but Tony has to live with the way it is. And as a girl from Brooklyn, as um, a girl who didn't finish college, as a girl who, well, I guess woman now, um, who has hung out with other women who, you know, have dealt with certain realities that other, I guess, other women don't deal with. Um, it was just so refreshing to see that, like, it's not enough to just wish it wasn't the case. What are we going to do in the meantime? And will you ever acknowledge that there are certain realities that certain people have to deal with on an everyday basis? Um, obviously, I'm, I, I'm not necessarily... I can't um, relate 100% with the Tony situation, um, but, you know, as someone with a dark-skinned mother and, and have, has dealt with the dynamics of colorism, I, I know how freaking real it is. But with that being said, it, it's more about acknowledging the bravery it takes for someone to say, like, just because I'm shallow doesn't mean, just because I have shallow values doesn't mean I'm not a deep person inside. Like, you don't think Tony wishes that? You don't think... Probably by ten years old, she figured out. Damn, it would be the world would be such a better place if I wouldn't if I didn't have to do this. Like, duh. Like Joan, you're not. You know, you're not. Like it's like newsflash, and I and I feel like um, it's refreshing to see that perspective because I think right now we have so many people who are talking about how they wish things were this way and it shouldn't be like this, and and I agree. But then you have people who have to deal with it. And wh where is their say? And when do we get to not judge them um, and actually acknowledge their, uh, I don't know, I guess you could, yeah, I guess you can say like bravery slash um, almost like also humility too. It's like uh, you think of Tony, someone like Tony, and you think, oh, like, I don't want to like her. She's a bitch. She's 
you know, but then you look deeper and you're like, oh, she actually is going through a lot of shit that I haven't considered. And that's what I love about the diva archetype is like, yeah, at first you're going to want, I, I love, I think as someone who's so desperate to be liked for between, I don't know, 16 to like 21, so desperate to be like adored and liked, it feels so good to want to like not be liked, to not care. Obviously, it's cool if you like me, but woo, it feels so good to not care. And at this point, I'm almost more motivated to kind of like test, like kind of test people's judgment based on like, like either you're going to want me to like be desperate for your approval and your like, or you're going to just respect me for who I am and what I do. And that's what I'm looking for. And that's what I guess I hope my work can inspire others to do. And that's why I'm dedicated to being the Diva Taoist because I don't want you, like, it's okay. Like, it's okay if, like, you're at a party and someone says, well, Alex is kind of bitchy. She's kind of a little, ugh. Like, I don't think it's okay to be, like, rude or anything like that. But as far as being, like, a realistic, kind of bougie, high-maintenance but good at what she does, specializing in results. <laughs> I'm okay with that because I, I, I almost feel like I'd rather like if, if I'm still getting business and I'm not necessarily like the most bubbly, like oh my god, please like me. Then that's how I know my stuff is good. <laughs> you know what I mean? And also, it's how I know my friends are real. It's how I know the love in my life is real. I don't need you to like me, but I I do want you to respect me. I'm just speaking for all my other people out there who can relate um, because, I don't know, personally, I just feel like there isn't enough of examples of uh, w people, particularly women, who, who are okay with unapologetically being who they are, even if who they are is a little shallow and different. Um, or their values are superficial, you know, not meaning that they, they aren't deep or have deep needs. I'm going to recommend a book to close this out. Um, the Coldest Winter Ever. I finished it a few weeks ago again. And the tale of Winter Santiago, who is the main character in the book, is also a beautiful example of who I'm talking about as far as someone being put in a position of immense intense reality and has no time to wish the world was a different place but has to respond to direct circumstances um if you're from brooklyn it's particularly a refreshing read and it's i think also what really motivated motivated me to be more open about um my you know my i guess you can say like philosophy about Taoism and things like that because at the end of the day this relationship between um non-interference direct reality and the steva archetype in my perspective are two sides of one pole the diva is the archetype it's the role it's the um it's almost like you know when you have a balloon and you're poking a needle through it and it looks like it's about to pop like it, it's pushing our culture and economy as far as it can go so you can just see how crazy it has become um because i just i've been on the planet long enough to know that unless you push something you're not going to really get um a response or reaction so um there's a beauty to it there's a beauty in that relationship and I hope I have articulated that beauty so you can have a better um, context to when I am playing my role and understanding who I am as well as far as like the undertones to all my work and the undertones to all of what I have to say about business and technology. So I hope that this has been helpful. I, I really enjoyed having this moment. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say, what your feedback is. Um, and... Um, yeah, I uh, I appreciate you. Um, thanks for listening and tune in again. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Alex Wolf Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review. And if you aren't already, make sure you're subscribed to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. For more resources on innovation, economics, and culture, visit alexwolf.co slash newsletter and sign up for my email list. Thanks.